Okay, in this section, we're going to cover the first part of our chapter six material on orthogonality and uh, least squares. So in this first section, we're going to talk about the concepts of the inner product, uh, length, and orthogonality of vectors in Rn. I know if you've taken uh, Calculus 3 before, you're familiar with some of these um, principles uh, for vectors in R2 or R3, uh, but in this section we will define those concepts uh, more generally for vectors in uh, n-dimensional space. Um, so let's start with the definition of the inner product or the dot product of two vectors. Uh, so here, if u and v are vectors in Rn, uh, so let's say u has components u1 through un, and v has uh, components v1 through vn, then we would define the inner product, or also known as the dot product of u and v, as the one-by-one one matrix, or simply uh, the scalar, uh, which is denoted as u dot v, and it's defined as the product of the transpose of u with v. Um, so if u is an n by one column vector, its transpose is a one by n row vector. Uh, and then when I multiply that by v, which is an n by one column vector, I get a one by one matrix or a scalar. And if we take that product, we would have the following. We would have the product of u1 and v1 plus the product of the second entries, u2 and v2, and so on, up through the product of un and vn. So the inner product, or the dot product of two vectors, which have the same length, uh, is defined as the sum of the products of their respective entries. So let's look at an example of this. In this first one, we're asked for the dot product of the two vectors, u and v, which are vectors in R3. Uh, so here we would have u dot v as the sum of the products of the components of these vectors. So again, for our first components, we would have 3 times 6, so 18, uh, plus the product of the second components, negative 1 and negative 2, which would be positive 2, plus the product of the last two components, negative 5 and positive 3, uh, which is negative 15. So altogether we have 20 minus 15, uh, which is 5. So now that we have this uh, concept defined, uh, a dot product or inner product of two vectors, uh, let's look at some properties of this dot product. Uh, so theorem 6.1 lists some of the basic properties of the dot product. Uh, so here they are. If we have three vectors u, v, and w in Rn, and C is a scalar or a one-by-one one matrix, then the dot product of u with v is the same as the dot product of v with u. That is, this product is commutative. Um, part B says that the sum of u and v uh, taking a dot product with w is the same uh, as the sum of the dot product of u and w with v and w. Uh, part C says that a scalar multiple of u uh, taking a dot product with v is the same as the scalar multiple of the dot product of u with v, uh, or taking the dot product of u with the same scalar multiple of v. And our last property says that the dot product of a vector u with itself is always non-negative, and in particular, the dot product of u with itself will be equal to zero if and only if u is equal to the zero vector. Uh, now that we have the dot product defined, uh, we can introduce the idea of the length of a vector in Rn. Um, so we would uh, define the length of a vector as follows. If v is some vector in Rn whose entries are v1 through vn, then the length or the norm of that vector v is the scalar, which is denoted uh, by writing v 
uh, with these double uh, vertical bars on either side of it. So it sort of looks like a double absolute value sign. Uh, so this is called the length or the norm of V. And it's defined to be the square root of the dot product of V with itself, uh, which remember is always non-negative by the last part of theorem 6.1. So the length or the norm of a vector is always defined. And if we take the dot product of V with itself, well, we're taking the sum of the products of the respective entries of V. So that would be the product of V1 with itself, or V1 squared, plus V2 squared, and so on, up through Vn squared. So from this definition, it follows that if we were to square the length of a vector, we would get the dot product of V with itself. Uh, now, along with the uh, definition of the length or the norm of a vector, uh, we would specify that any vector which has a length of one is called a unit vector. And uh, uh, several problems of interest involve finding a unit vector uh, that is moving in the same direction as a given vector. Um, so how would we do that? Well, if we divide any non-zero vector v by its length, then we obtain a unit vector u uh, in the same direction as v. So a unit vector u in the direction of a vector v uh, could be defined by taking v and dividing through by its uh, length or its norm. Or equivalently, uh, we would take v and multiply by the scalar 1 over its length. And this process of finding a unit vector in the direction of a vector is called normalizing uh, a vector. So let's look at some examples of this. Uh, in this first one, we are asked to find a unit vector in the direction of V, which is a vector in R3. So we need to first find the length of this vector. So the length of a vector, V, is defined as the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So here we would have uh, the square root of negative 6 squared, uh, which would be 36, uh, plus the square root of 4 squared, which is 16, uh, and then plus uh, the square root of negative 3 squared, which is 9. Um, so altogether, we have the square root of uh, 36 plus 25, uh, which would be root 61. Uh, so this doesn't simplify nicely. Uh, and then we would take as our unit vector u, uh, the vector v divided by the length of v. Uh, so we would have the vector where we take each component of v and divide by this length. So my first component would be negative 6 over root 61, 4 over root 61, and negative 3 over root 61. Now in our next example, if we have a uh, set w, which is a subspace of R2, and it is the subspace which is spanned by the vector x, uh, whose components are 8 thirds and 2. Uh, we're supposed to find a unit vector uh, that is a basis for w. So here we have the subspace w, which is spanned by the single vector x. Uh, and clearly, any single vector is uh, linearly independent as long as it's not the zero vector. So a basis for this uh, space w would be the vector x itself. So we can say a basis for w is the set b consisting of the single vector x. So what that means is uh, for any vector, um, let's call it little w, in the space capital W, uh, we can write little w as some scalar multiple, well, let's call it c, times the vector x, which was 8 thirds, 2.
Um, now, as we did for uh, eigenvectors, if we don't like one of our components of the vector being a fraction, we can think about grouping that fractional term with our arbitrary constant out in front of this vector. So we could say that any uh, vector in W could be expressed as some constant uh, times 8, 6. That is, if we uh, make our constant C three times what the original C was, then every vector in W can be written as a uh, multiple of this vector 8, 6. So this vector is a basis for W. Let's call it V. Um, so we want a unit vector that would form a basis uh, for W. Um, so we're just going to normalize our basis vector V here. Um, so if we look at the norm of V, uh, we would have the square root of the sum of the squares of our components. Uh, so here, 8 squared would be 64, plus 6 squared is 36. So together we're left with root 100, or 10. Uh, and then to find a unit vector, which is a basis for the space W, we would take the vector V and divide through by its length. So we would have the vector 8 over 10, 6 over 10, or if we want to simplify, we could say 4 fifths and 3 fifths would be a unit vector, which is a basis for this space W. Now the next concept that we'll talk about in this section uh, is defining distance in n-dimensional space, so that is distance in Rn. Um, so if we have u and v as two vectors in Rn, we would define the distance between u and v uh, as follows, and this is denoted as dist uh, of u and v, and it's defined as the length of the vector u minus v. So that is the distance between two vectors, u and v, is the length or the norm of the difference u minus v. Um, so if we're talking about vectors specifically in R2 uh, or R3, that is in the plane or space, this definition of distance would coincide uh, with the usual formulas for Euclidean distance between two points uh, in uh, the plane or space. So we can visualize this definition a little bit. If we have two vectors, let's say u and v in, say, the plane or space, uh, the distance between these two vectors would be the following distance. That is the distance um, uh, or the length of the difference of u and v. So let's consider an example of this. In this first problem, we're asked to find the distance between the vectors x and y, uh, which are vectors in the plane. Um, so in order to define our distance between x and y, we're going to take the norm or the length of the vector x minus y. So we need to find the vector x minus y first. So here x minus y would be the vector whose first component is 10 minus a negative one, so 11. And our second component uh, would be negative 3 minus a negative 5, or plus 5, uh, which is 2. So the distance between our vectors is then the norm of that vector, which is the square root of the sum of the squares of our components. So that is the square root of 11 squared uh, plus 2 squared, or the square root of 121 plus 4, 
Um, so we have the square root of 125, which is the same as the square root of 5 times 25. So we have 5 root 5 for uh, the distance between these two vectors. Now we can see here uh, that this definition for distance coincides with the typical Euclidean distance between points in uh, the plane uh, because this expression uh, for the norm or the length of the difference between x and y is in general uh, found by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the vector x minus y, which would have components x1 uh, minus y1 and x2 minus y2. So we recognize this expression as the uh, Euclidean distance between two points, say x1 um, y1 and x2 y2 in the plane. All right. Uh, so uh, let's consider another example. Um, so here we would have uh, the problem of finding the distance between the two vectors u and v, which are now vectors in R3. Uh, so again, the distance between two vectors, say u and v, is defined as the length of the difference u minus v. So let's start by finding u minus v. So our first component of this vector will be 0 minus negative 4, or 4. Our second component is negative 5 minus a negative 1, or plus 1, which gives us negative 4. And then our last component is 2 minus 8, or negative 6. So for this distance, we're taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of that vector, um, so we would have the square root of um, our first component squared, which would be 16, uh, plus the square root of negative 4 squared, which is 16, uh, plus the square root of 6, which is 36. So we have uh, the square root of 68, uh, which is the same as 4 times 17. Uh, so this leaves us with twice the square root of 17 for the distance between those vectors. And again, we see that in general, this uh, expression for distance, that is the, the norm or the length of the difference u minus v, uh, would correspond to the Euclidean distance in R3 between two points. So here, uh, for the vector u minus v, the components would be u1 minus v1, which we're then squaring, plus u2 minus v2, which we're squaring, plus uh, u3 minus v3 squared. So we see that this is the same as uh, the standard formula for distance between uh, two points in um, space. So the next thing we'll talk about in this section is the um, concept of two vectors being perpendicular, uh, but for uh, generalized vectors in R in. So these vectors are called orthogonal vectors. Um, so let's define this. We would say that two vectors u and v in R in uh, are said to be orthogonal, uh, which is really just a, a fancy math term for two vectors being perpendicular to each other, uh, if their dot product or inner product is zero. And the convention that we'll use is that the zero vector is considered to be orthogonal to every vector in Rn, since the dot product of the zero vector with any vector is equal to zero. So let's look at an example where we're given two vectors and we have to determine whether they are orthogonal. So in part A, we have the vectors u and v in space, 
And to determine if they're orthogonal, we would look at their dot product, u dot v. So taking the product of the first two components, 12 and 2, we would have 24, plus the product of the second two components would be a negative 9, and then plus the product of the last two components is negative 15. So we would have 24 minus 24, which is 0. So since the dot product is 0, we would say that u and v are orthogonal. Now in part b, uh, we have the vectors x and v, uh, which are vectors in R4 here. And to determine whether they are orthogonal, we would take their dot product, that is x dot v. So taking the product of the first components, we have negative 3 plus the product of the second components uh, gives us negative 56. The product of the third components uh, would be 60, and then the product of the fourth components is 0. So we have 60 minus 59 is 1, uh, which is non-zero. So here the vectors u and v, uh, excuse me, x and v, uh, are not orthogonal. Uh, now to go along with orthogonal uh, vectors, using this definition we can establish a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem, uh, which says if we're considering two vectors u and v, uh, they would be orthogonal if and only if the sum of the squares of their lengths is equal to the square of the length of the sum. Um, so here we can extend uh, the definition of the Pythagorean theorem from uh, points or vectors in a plane uh, or space to uh, n-dimensional um, vectors. So the last thing that we'll talk about in uh, this section is the concept of an orthogonal complement. Um, so this definition or this concept of an orthogonal complement will be used uh, throughout the remainder of our chapter six material. Um, so let's start by defining the orthogonal complement of a set. So if a vector z is orthogonal to every vector in some subspace w of Rn, so that is z is ortho, uh, or the dot product of z with any vector from that subspace is zero, then the vector z is said to be orthogonal to the space w itself. And the set of all vectors z uh, that are orthogonal to a subspace w is called the orthogonal complement of w. And this is denoted uh, by w with a superscript uh, these, uh, using this little perpendicular uh, lines expression. Uh, so this expression is read as w perpendicular or more simply w perp. Um, so to illustrate this, let's say that we have some subspace of R in, we'll call it W, uh, and we're considering vectors, let's say W, that lie within our space W. So uh, any vector Z that lies orthogonal, that is, perpendicular to every vector in W is uh, said to be orthogonal to W itself, and the set of all vectors Z that are orthogonal to W, so that would consist of vectors that are scalar multiples of Z. These would all be uh, orthogonal to each vector in W. So that set of all possible vectors is denoted as uh, W perp or um, uh, and called the orthogonal complement of W. Uh, 
So uh, we'll state a couple of facts about the orthogonal complement of a space, uh, which will come into play a little bit later in this chapter. Um, so here, uh, the following two facts about W perp, uh, where W is a subspace of R in, uh, will be used later in the chapter. So the first of these facts is that a vector X is in the orthogonal complement of W if and only if X is orthogonal to every vector in a set that spans W. And that sort of makes sense. If we have a set that spans W, that means that every vector in W is a linear combination of the vectors in its spanning set. So as long as X is orthogonal to every vector within that spanning set, uh, when I take a dot product of X with any linear combination of those vectors, uh, so that would be the dot product of any uh, of x with any vector in w, I'll get zero. Um, so would, that would mean that x lies in uh, the orthogonal complement itself. And the second condition is that the orthogonal complement of a subspace of R in is also a subspace of R in. So we can show that the three conditions hold the zero vector is certainly in the orthogonal complement because it's orthogonal to every vector. And if we take the sum of any two vectors in W perp or any scalar multiple of a vector in W perp, uh, then uh, those um, sums or scalar multiples will also lie within that orthogonal complement. Uh, so the last part of this section <coughs> uh, will have a theorem 6.3 uh, which gives a proof of a claim that we had given earlier in chapter four uh, regarding some subspaces associated with a matrix and their orthogonality. Um, so this theorem says if we have any matrix A, which is some M by N matrix, the orthogonal complement of the row space of A is equal to the null space of A and the orthogonal complement of the column space of A is equal to the null space of a uh, perp, um, or a uh, transpose, this should be. Not a perp, but a transpose. Um, so that is the orthogonal complement of the row space of a matrix is the null space of that matrix. Uh, and the orthogonal complement of the column space of a matrix is the null space of the transpose of that matrix. So let's see if we can establish this result. Um, so we'll start by saying if the vector X is in the null space of A, uh, then that means A times X is equal to the zero vector and based off the way that uh, matrix multiplication by a vector is defined, that means that the vector X is orthogonal uh, to each row of the matrix A itself. Now, since the rows of the matrix A uh, span the row space of A by definition. Uh, that means that X is orthogonal to that row space of A uh, using this fact uh, number one uh, about the orthogonal complement that we had seen earlier. So if a vector is orthogonal to every vector in a set that spans a space, so since X is orthogonal to uh, every row of A and the rows of A span the row space, that means uh, that uh, X is um, in a uh, that orthogonal complement of the row space. Now, conversely, 
uh, if x is orthogonal to uh, the row space of A, then x is orthogonal to each uh, row of A, since each row of A lies within the row space. Um, and so, uh, A times X would have to equal to the zero vector based off the way that we've defined uh, the product of a matrix A uh, with a vector X. Um, therefore, uh, we have shown that the orthogonal complement of the row space of a matrix is equal to its null space uh, by showing that these sets are subsets of one another. So in the first part of this proof, we've said, uh, well, if X is an element of the null space, then X is orthogonal to row A. So X must also lie in the orthogonal complement of the row space. And at the same time, if X is a member of the orthogonal complement of the row space, then we've shown A times X is equal to zero, so X must also be in the null space of A. So if these two spaces are subspaces of one another, they must equal one another. So that establishes the first part of our theorem. Um, now, to prove the next part of this theorem, uh, We've shown that this result holds for any matrix. So since this holds for any matrix A, uh, it holds for the transpose of any matrix. Uh, therefore, if we consider the orthogonal complement of the row space of a transpose, we've shown that that's equal to the null space of a transpose. However, recall that the row space of a transpose is the same as the column space of A. So the orthogonal uh, complement of the column space of a matrix is equal to the null space of the transpose of that matrix.